current theory says the dinosaurs came to an end when a giant asteroid from space crashed into Earth. Wouldn't it be ironic then if we sent asteroids out from Earth into deep space to colonize other worlds? A few weeks back we were discussing interstellar colonization strategies and next week we'll be discussing planetary terraforming strategies for when a colony ship arrives at a new world, but one of the strategies we didn't cover last week was the possibility of using asteroids as spaceships to travel to new systems. Now normally I don't think of this as a good option, for many reasons we'll discuss today, but the big one has usually been they are simply a fuel hog compared to far less massive ships made from hollowing out the asteroid and refining its ores to make a ship. When I was writing interstellar colonization strategies though, I talked about how big or was better when it came to colony ships, as they have more cargo, redundancy, and endurance. Those are fuel hogs too, but we wouldn't really care because the fuel in question, hydrogen or perhaps deuterium or helium-3, is so incredibly abundant. So the idea of launching some asteroid massing a trillion tons into space, using trillions of tons of fusion fuel, seems absurd at first, but the economics say otherwise. As it turns out, the fuel part is the easy part. Even by modern standards, the cost to pump liquid hydrogen in some tank is going to be way less than the cost to build that tank. Hydrogen is relatively rare on Earth and helium more so, but they are the two most abundant elements in the Universe, each outnumbering every other type of element combined. So in an economy with advanced automation and humanity scattered all around the solar system, tanking huge amounts of hydrogen from one of those gas giants, or from a comet to fill some big rock up, is going to be easier than refining all that rock down into metals to make spaceships anyway. Alternatively, some big asteroid or comet offers a lot of advantages as a spaceship, interplanetary or interstellar. There are some definite downsides, but once you remove the fuel burden from the equation, I think the positives might outweigh those in many cases. Additionally, fuel is not always an issue, for instance we have a device known as a planetary cycler or aldrin cycler. This is essentially a large spaceship or space station on its own planetary orbit, typically a very long elliptical one, timed to bring it close to two separate planets or bodies, so an Earth-Mars cycler will be a long elliptical orbit around the Sun, taking a couple years and spending most of it out beyond Mars, but would make for relatively short journeys of 5 months from Earth to Mars and Mars to Earth for any ship that docks with them as they pass by either planet. This also works for moons, and the backflip cycler option for Earth and our moon, which would be more of a monthly timeline, is probably a good option. What's neat about these cyclers is that once you put them into their orbit, aside from some optional contingency fuel for emergency maneuvers, they require no more fuel to continue their orbit than any other heavenly body orbiting the sun does, basically none. Objects in motion remain in motion unless acted on by another force, and barring minor perturbations, the only force acting on a planet orbiting our sun is the sun's gravity acting like a sling to whip the planet around in circles, or elliptical orbits. Thus they are perfect for some big asteroid to be nudged into that orbit, and may just require us to apply a little station keeping to occasionally. Ships dock with it and take advantage of its huge mass to provide radiation shielding and resupply, allowing faster passenger or cargo ships to use far less fuel and armor, and rendezvous with what's essentially a mixture of ferry and truck stop, slow but cheap and reliable bulk transport. The same reasoning applies to interstellar arc ships as they will run up to that speed and then cruise through space for decades before slowing down at their destination. What's neat about them is that you can also be working to refine parts of that asteroid into raw materials for your onboard industry, and your colonization gear once you arrive. So in theory, a very basic and small colony organization could grab an asteroid, ranging from less than a kilometer wide to several, fill it with fusion fuel, and head out to the stars on a multi-century journey while transforming that asteroid into a bigger community and possibly even a fleet of escort vessels. Now we keep saying that we'll hollow out the asteroid, but that's probably not the right way to think of it. More likely you would just have big thin balloons of fuel you attach behind the asteroid, since most of the fuel would be burnt in a few months as you accelerate the cruising speed, so any complex and long lasting storage system would seem a waste. By default, folks assume you need the same fuel to speed up and slow down, but that's not true. Since you have to accelerate your slow down fuel too, It generally takes about 3 times as much starting fuel as stopping fuel. 
so for every 4 tanks of fuel you need, 3 will only need simple storage for while you bring them to the ships and then launch it, the 4th will need to be stored for decades at least. Of course there's probably a 5th for us and the ship for running power production during the trip and as a reserve and backup. These we can strap behind too, and then we could cut some rock out from the asteroid for some living area and stack that amount of tanks to make them sturdier like bricks, or an ice wall, and further minimize leakage. A lot of the asteroids we might use for this are likely to be those deeper out in the asteroid belt or even its larger twin, the Kuiper Belt, and those would have a lot of ice on them too. Many asteroids aren't solid rock either but more like giant piles of frozen gravel, so using ice and gravel as an exterior shield for bits you're building behind the ship makes a lot of sense. We tend to think of using metallic asteroids so we'd have plenty of material, as opposed to carbonaceous ones, but carbon is the material that ultra hard diamond and ultra strong graphene are made of, so much of our structure might be provided by carbon rich asteroids rather than the rare or metallic variety. Graphene has lots of great properties but three interests us in particular. First, it can make great liner for fuel tanks, as hydrogen is prone to leaking out and also corroding things, part of our problem using it for rockets and for a hydrogen fuel economy. Graphene is much better at storing it compared to other methods. Second, since we can make graphene into strong, ultra-thin sheets just an atom wide, we can make huge sails out of it for catching sunlight, laser or energy beams, or even interstellar dust. More on that later, but a single square sheet of graphene a kilometer on each side would only weigh 2.27 grams, and few layers would be needed. Indeed a sheet big enough to cover every bit of our own planet would only weigh about 1200 tons, versus trillions of tons for even a fairly small asteroid, and you could coat an asteroid or comet in layers of graphene to keep it from leaking away from melting or micro collisions, or from disintegrating. Your typical asteroid isn't really held together by much, Gravity inside them is tiny even compared to our moon, so bits of asteroid will go flying off into deep space just from tapping it. We would need spin gravity to give people gravity to live with, but we cannot spin an asteroid or it would fly to pieces. Which takes us to the third handy bit. Graphene has enormous tensile strength, which is great for space elevators and other tethers, such as if we want to tow things far behind the ship for safety, like an antimatter reservoir or radioactive fission fuel. It also makes a nice net for holding our asteroid together if we did spin it, but we probably wouldn't want to anyway. It makes more sense to dig out a cylinder shaped crater and put a small routine habitat drum in there as opposed to trying to spin the whole thing. In practice you would probably find a nice crater of about the desired diameter, then dig it out a bit and use the parts extracted to build up and around you so you had a hollow cylinder partially protruding from the asteroid and partially embedded into it. Or you might dig your hab drum in completely for maximum shielding and use the extracted bits for constructing fuel drums, manufacturing facilities, hydroponics, or other areas of lower priority for shielding. You can also use the same technique on a comet, which tends to have a lot of rock and metal too, but all principally ice of water, ammonia, and methane, and you can melt out tunnels, separate the components, and pipe the fluids to radiated areas to refreeze it and use it for construction or storage. As time goes on, your big rock is going to start taking on more artificial characteristics and probably shifting toward being long and skinny, as that's a better shape for high speed travel than a sphere. Not that many asteroids really are spherical. The big famous ones are all like Ceres, which is practically a dwarf planet, but most are no more spherical than any other rock you'd find on Earth. They're a lump or glob, and any resemblance to a specific geometry is mostly coincidental. Over time the rock might start to look more streamlined but that might be a project of years or even millennia. Even a modest asteroid, like the kind we have thousands of in our solar system, might have thousands of miles of tunnels and hundreds of cylinder habitats and giant chambers in it. I should also note that you can merge asteroids fairly easily in most cases, they're just heaps of gravel or ice, so merging a comet with your asteroid to give it fuel and an icy coating might be a common exercise as would be adding a second asteroid to one you've already built. A lot depends on how long the mission is planning to last, and that involves many factors. The first is your power supply and starship drive. We all assume no FTL or warp options, though if you had those I'm sure you would utilize them, and such a ship might still be great for intergalactic travel. By default, we tend to assume fusion power, and we discussed that a bit already, but there are other options. Antimatter of course if you can make and store it. 
Black hole drives are excellent, same problem though, but with black holes you can feed them anything. Both would have little difficulty getting up to somewhere between a quarter and half of light speed, versus the more like 5% to 15% that fusion might permit. Nuclear fission using uranium or thorium via an Orion Drive or Medusa Drive or some other variant is probably getting you somewhere around 1-5%. to And those are top speeds, in any case you might be a whole order of magnitude slower. Those are vague numbers. I know it drives folks nuts that we can't give more specific values for how fast this or that ship drive might go, but it's sort of like asking the Wright Brothers how fast a plane can go and expecting a specific speed. They don't know how to engineer a jet yet and even if they did, a fighter jet and a big cargo plane are very different animals with very different speed profiles, which are also dependent on cost of fuel or pilots. You also aren't always willing to go for maximum speed, it's just so easy to think of that vast supply of hydrogen and assume you're going to max things out when it saves years on the journey. However, engines probably cost a lot of money and time to build and repair, and probably wear down proportional to usage, so there's no real guarantee folks will go for 12% of light speed if that was the maximum fusion allowed, if 10% basically cost half the price. We also have options like laser sails, where it's all about huge energy collectors pouring incredible amounts of energy into the back of the ship to either push along with reflected light, or power huge ion drives that are more like particle accelerators than rockets. Here, a ship speed is basically about how much energy you dump in from home, and this method of proportion is less reliant on the rocket equation, especially for laser reflection and so the amount of power needed to get it to higher speeds is lower, but it also takes real energy you already made back home, so people might be a bit more miserly with it than with tons of hydrogen on some gas giant, especially when we're talking about moving a mountain. But let's consider a few specific scenarios as options and start with 1036 Ganymede, which in spite of its name is a near-Earth asteroid not Jupiter and its moon Ganymede, and is also a Mars crosser so it might be ideal for turning into a planetary cycler one day, with one big, big problem, it's 40 kilometers across and should have mass somewhere near 100 trillion tons, making it billions of times heavier than any spaceship we've ever made before, and each ton of that would need many millions of joules of kinetic energy to nudge it onto the desired course, think millions of megatons of explosives. So on the one hand, common sense says pick another smaller asteroid or even break a chunk of this one off and use that instead. On the other hand, a 1000 by 1000 kilometer orbital array sending its power to that rock 24-7 could get the job done in a few years, and as we noted earlier, a single graphene panel that size would only mass a couple thousand tons, and even if made many layers thick it's still pretty minimal. I'd imagine you would do dozens of circular ones of a more modest diameter orbiting closer to the sun where they get more power and use those to move it up to speed. Scale matters though because I can casually talk about giant ultra-thin mirror only massing a few thousand tons, but the power output of that object is a billion megawatts, around 50 times what the power consumption of humanity is these days. We do actually have some lasers that are that powerful incidentally, they just usually fire for a nanosecond or less. Meanwhile this could be going for years, you can run a lot of industry and economy on something like that, and it's usually why I don't think civilizations would use asteroid ships, but we do have to remember that scale and what it is to them. Interstellar space colonization is likely to occur at a time when all of humanity is still numbered in the billions or maybe low trillions but has easy access to space, and a sun that puts out 400 billion times the power this beam needs and a couple billion times what lands on Earth as sunlight, they're not having a shortage of available sunlight, nor carbon or aluminum for mirrors or lenses, so to them the cost is simply producing the mirror and focusing equipment and controls. They wouldn't even have to be graphene either, robots rolling aluminum foil on the moon or from that asteroid would need to make a lot more in mass, a few hundred megatons probably, but even so, that's comparable to modern production of aluminum, but in this scenario, the cost of aluminum is probably way cheaper since the bottleneck on aluminum production is electricity, which means once you get it going, it gets even cheaper still to actually do. Now such immense beams are far more than that asteroid is going to need to run life support and hydroponics once it is positioned on its long orbit around the sun that makes it pass Earth and Mars over and over. 
more likely would have its own set of parabolic mirrors towed around with it that beam power into collectors for it, or maybe it would have a lot of nuclear reactors. This thing is a giant star fortress too. It's not for ferrying a few dozen people and some cargo around, it's not like smaller cyclos that might be thought of as a cruise ship or container ship, it's basically a hollow mountain, and it's going to become a major space city or nation all on its own. On the surface of its 35 kilometer wide bulk are a vast number of craters and canyons, natural, artificial, and those in between. Each one of those is a potential space dock, and sometimes that's for big cargo hollows that are hundreds of meters long themselves, and other times it's for small space yachts. All around 1036 Ganymede would be various antennae and dishes and tethered solar panels of facilities, and inside it dozens of cylinder habitation drums stretching a kilometer each or more. It's huge and home to millions, most on temporary 5 month journeys between Earth and Mars or vice versa. It could house billions, and one day will, and is probably vastly bigger than you really need for a cycler. We're basically turning something considerably bigger than the island of Guam into a giant shipping vessel, and it's three dimensional too, not just a small island surface, but the whole mountain connecting it down to the ocean floor. You could stuff every building humanity has made into that volume with room to spare and has enough raw materials to build that many times over as our buildings are generally hollow. 1036 Ganymede is the biggest of the near-Earth asteroids but there are hundreds of bigger ones in the asteroid belt and millions that would honestly be better suited as a cycler, we were using an intentionally large case. An asteroid that was maybe half a kilometer or less across probably is a better pick in the near-Earth term. That could be hollowed out to form a large metropolis with plenty of warehouse and tank space and needing barely a millionth the energy and thrust to get them aligned on a good trajectory to serve as a cycler to various planets and moons. You might transform one into a giant hydroponics farm too, mostly hollow and huge, that had a growth phase when it was close to the sun, then dropped its food off afterwards and maybe concentrated the weaker light it got further from the sun into a smaller region for getting younger plants growing. In this way a long stream of cyclers might bring food to Jupiter for instance and bring deuterium or helium-3 back to Earth. But let's take our big asteroid and see what might happen to them. Say that after serving as a big cycler for a couple centuries and reaching a population of a couple million, it decides it's tired of being a constant pond between various Earth and Martian power groups, it's even been invaded a few times, though the thick crust of stone and rabbit worn of tunnels inside made that a very unsuccessful effort the last try. They are not interested in another, and they've done great financially over the years, so they're cutting a deal with the governor of Neptune's largest chandelier city to refit them for new model fusion reactors and pump them up on fusion fuel. They're going to sell all their local hoardings to pay for that and for some serious beaming power from the various solar conglomerates. They are not stopping at Neptune, everything is going to be carefully tied to rendezvous with them as they corkscrew out of the system and they're going to try to drop a big dish behind them to focus that beaming power on them as they head out into the Oort Cloud. By the year 2626 they are moving out of the solar system at 10% of light speed and have finished installing their reactors and rigging their ship for interstellar space. You might be picturing a big rock tumbling through the void, but in reality that's just the centerpiece, strung out behind it are millions of buckyball shaped fuel reservoirs and some other ancillary facilities eat a few small habitation rings for the folks who tend the trailing fuel pods. Way behind them is a big satellite dish and detection array for monitoring space this side and behind, and for talking back to Neptune, with whom they have a multi-century contract to send them news and tech updates. If you're looking sideways from the asteroid or from the trailing fuel tanks, you don't actually see the stars, rather there's a lot of thin sheets of graphene spun out around it as rings, just a few atoms thick and a lot of them are slightly different diameters and spin rates. Their only real job is to get smashed up by any space rock that comes at an angle and at high speed, shredding the panel in question but shredding the rock too, so it's more like scattered dust when it hits the ship. Forward of the asteroid ship is something similar, the ship looks like it has a giant umbrella poking forward out of it. That thin forward shield exists only get hammered by any space junk the asteroid would otherwise run into at relativistic speeds. Skinny diamond shafts hold the umbrellas out in front. Such collisions are of such high energy that they match a nuclear bomb of the same mass and utterly vaporize everything involved, 
so a thin sheet is ideal for this, you just replace the damaged section with another patch. They are working on a second layer even further out and are trying to decide what the best approach will be for mixing in forward physical shields with detectors and point defense lasers. This isn't a sail in the classic sense, but they treat it a bit like their prow's figurehead or flag, and have an elaborate quilt of colored patches on the forward shield. The newest one was painted by a class of third graders in the ship's school. There are several thousand students in each grade level these days. Now originally they had been planning to use the remaining fuel to run to a slightly higher speed and save the rest for deceleration and operations and route, but they decided they are going to go faster and instead opt to build more ships out of the asteroid's mass. Again, the asteroid contains more raw materials than humanity has ever used in every single building and vehicle humanity ever made for the space age really kicked off. One of those ships will outpace the fleet by a few light months and deploy the sequential solar slowing method we've discussed elsewhere, firing off big shells from its forward railgun containing packed up solar sails and beaming equipment. Those will fly toward their destination sun, slowed by its light as they unfurl, and the first one will soak up that light and fire it as a beam back to a second one, slowing yet more, and it will repeat the process to the third and the fourth, with each sail crashing into the star until one finally slows enough to orbit that star instead. At the success of that operation, 1036 Ganymede, known these days as the Rock, will briefly open holes in its umbrella and begin a volley of railgun fire containing thousands of those shells, each containing billions of square meters of graphene sailcloth. Once those are fired, it will begin unfolding an even larger sail to receive that energy as it gets beamed in, becoming briefly larger than a planet in cross-section. That sail will get torn to pieces as it gets pummeled by space dust and beamed energy, but will protect the rock and its escorts as the huge energy supply from their destination slows them down. That's all in the future though, for when they arrive at their destination around the year 3000, Right now it's the 28th century and they've been cruising along and growing their numbers. Day to day life inside the asteroid is culturally a lot like the late 20th century to early 21st, because a lot of the early space cultures idolized the early space race period in the same way folks often do for Elizabethan England or the Roman Republic or classic Athens, so lots of denim jeans and Coca Cola, plus some extra cultural mix of Neo Appalachian coal miner that got popular in the asteroid belt in the 23rd century. They are not short of technology of course, they are essentially the opposite of post-scarcity civilization in the traditional sense since they have a set amount of fuel and resources, but their losses to production and consumption and recycling inefficiencies are small enough that their engineers claim they could coast all the way to the Draco Dwarf Galaxy a quarter of a million light years from home, a spheroidal galaxy that is one of our main galaxy's many, many, many cannibalized victims and is perhaps best known as the object with the highest concentration of dark matter that we've currently absorbed. That is not their destination, but they get there in just over a million years at their current cruising speed of 20% light speed. There is some debate on if they really have enough fuel to run their reactors that long, especially as leakage happens, but they are confident their current telescopic arrays could spot any decent sized frozen ball of ice in interstellar space and they could send a robotic tender behind to power decelerate and land on it and deploy an automated refinery and railgun system to launch fuel pods to them to capture. Several cousin vessels are planning on similar attempts and we will report success or failure as it happens, plus light lag for the signal of course. They're planning to field test that at some point but they don't really plan on needing it as they already have a destination. With a population now over a few million and with a couple of centuries of breeding and advanced medicine, they expect to have a pretty big colony when the time comes, but they still won't have used most of their rock yet. Now it's sort of the tradition on the rock to have worked as a miner at some point, up to and including swinging a real, vintage pickaxe, which is quite a trick in microgravity, but most of the real mining is done by robots with minimal human supervision and honestly that's true of everything on the ship in terms of primary production of goods and food. Tunnels don't really need much shoring up in microgravity and they use something like spray on diamond foam for them, so the whole place is shot through with thousands of kilometers of tunnels these days, ranging from just wide enough for a person to float down head first to big wide ones with a rotating cylinder inside. Many of these will feature lighting in small gardens, 
but generally people only live inside habitation gems 100 meters wide or larger, which are plentiful enough. The rock itself has all sorts of cylinders and towers and tethers hanging out the back of it and what people call the curtain wall, where giant blocks of stone a couple meters wide were placed back from the equator of the rock to form a vast cylinder wall over 200 kilometers in circumference, and growing in height toward the back of the ship every year. Neat thing about microgravity is that you can actually move a 10 ton block on your own as a person, though in air it will resist being shoved on more and slow down as the air drags it to a halt. It is more of a psychological barrier but it's another tradition, every adult has put a block in at some point and carved their name on it, usually many times, a lot of people nowadays make it a birthday tradition, and some similar ones apply to carving out new tunnels, slowly turning the rock into something that looks a bit like a floating island with skyscrapers and towers on top of it, falling through the void with millions of fuel pods dragged behind it or above. They estimate they could easily house billions but they would need to send out resource gatherers at that point, and would need many more centuries than their journey requires to reach that number, though some talk about just leaving colonies behind and never stopping the rock, and maybe going all the way out to Draco, and they already are less of a single community and more like a metropolis with many suburbs and satellite communities, all the way from the deep caverns in the rock to the communication array tenders nearly a hundred kilometers behind dragged by long tethers. Such could be our experience with asteroid ships, in the end, if you can pay the power bill or the shipping cost for the fusion fuel, it's incredibly easy to just land on one and dig in and convert it over time and need into a spaceship and other facilities. A comet, especially one with a rocky center, would work even better for this purpose, and partially because they're already nearly interstellar, saving you the fuel need to break them away from the solar system. We'll continue this discussion next week though as we contemplate planetary terraforming strategies. As someone who tries to cover the future and science, it is important for me to stay up to date, and one of the things that drives me nuts is having to check in every morning to see what is going on in the world and getting slammed by endless clickbait news articles pitching sensationalism and typically just copying each other on whatever point of view that particular journalist got from their echo chamber they write for. It is a problem everyone recognizes regardless of where they're at on the political spectrum or the planet but it seems like anyone proposing a fix is really just offering another echo chamber to visit, and that's what impressed me about Ground News, it's not a news site, rather it's the world's first news comparison platform that shows you how breaking news is being covered across the political spectrum, and gives you a visual breakdown of the news sources covering a story and where they align politically. It also shows you blind spots, like which news stories are being underreported by one side or the other and you can watch how international stories are being covered across the globe using the interactive map. Co-founded by Harleen Kaur, who got her start working for NASA on the New Horizons spacecraft, Ground News is a platform that makes it easy to swipe between headlines to discover which details are emphasized, exaggerated, or left out entirely, and you can even see your own news bias preferences, if you'd rather not live in an echo chamber. Ground News is not better news, it's a better way to read the news, and you can go to ground.news slash Isaac Arthur to try Ground News for free, or subscribe to get access to all the features you see here and support our show and a small team of independent media outsiders working to make the news more transparent. Again, that's ground.news slash Isaac Arthur. So that's it for today, but we still have our monthly livestream coming up this weekend, Sunday, January 29th at 4pm Eastern Time, where I and my lovely wife and co-host Sarah take live questions on the show and our topics from the audience chat. Then it's on to February to talk about turning barren planets into homes for humanity with Thursday's February 2nd episode, Planetary Terraforming Strategies. Then on February 9th we'll discuss a surprising candidate for possibly hosting alien life, large oceanic worlds with massive hydrogen atmospheres, or Hycean planets. And don't forget to join us after that for the Mid-Month Sci-Fi Sunday episode on February 12th where we'll look at the concept of super soldiers. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. 
You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula at nebula.tv slash Isaac As always, thanks for watching and have a great week.